with Extension Forestry started. at North Carolina State University and Don Riley with U.S. Department of Ag Natural Resources Conservation Service. Jennifer has her bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of Delaware and her master's degree in forestry from Clemson University. Before coming to North Carolina State University, she was a biological technician for the U.S. Forest Service. She provides prescribed fire extension expertise for the Southeast Regional Partnership for Planning and Sustainability, also known as SURPASS, and their, their prescribed fire work group. Don has his bachelor's degree in forest management and also fisheries and wildlife sciences from North Carolina State University. He is a North Carolina registered forester, a certified wildlife biologist, and a North Carolina certified prescribed burner. He has spent time working in the private sector and with the state government. He has been with NRCS for nine years and is currently their state biologist. At the end of this presentation, we will also be joined by Robert Horton and Robert Smith. Robert Horton is, with, is the resource conservationist with NRCS and is responsible for forestry activities in, of NRCS in North Carolina. He has 35 years of experience, 20 in the field, and 15 in support of field activities. His family owns Woodland in South Carolina where they do prescribed burning. Robert Smith works in law enforcement under Forest Protection for North Carolina Forest Service. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I know this is a busy time of year for everyone, so I just wanted to say that we really appreciate everyone listening in. Today's webinar was developed due to a meeting that we had with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in North Carolina. And we noted that there is a need for more burning in North Carolina and other southeastern states than can currently be accomplished. So to meet this need, there will have to be more certified burners on the ground. So today's webinar will be focused on ways in which forestry consultants can take part in prescribed fire opportunities. Today's presentation will begin with the need for prescribed fire, then we'll move to income opportunities through the North Carolina uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service for conducting prescribed burns, the types of education and training required to become a burner, insurance options, and liability protection under the North Carolina Prescribed Burning Act. We'll end with prescribed fire resources, and from there we'll answer any questions from, taken from the chat box. So throughout the presentation, if you do have questions, please feel free to type them in there and we'll answer them at the end. So first we want to start with a question so that we can know who is in our audience and how many of you are already offering prescribed burning services to your clients. So if you could, please answer whether or not you currently offer prescribed burning. Um, we're going to go ahead and change the, the polling type here so that you can answer um, A through D. And if you could, in the same area before where you had answered yes or no, go ahead and choose A, B, C, or D, uh, A, yes, B, no, C, not currently, or D, not applicable if you're not a forestry consultant. And I'll give everyone a few seconds to respond. So we'll go ahead and uh, publish those results to see where everyone is. Great. So it looks like about nine of you, or uh, 18 percent of you, are actually um, already offering burning, and about eight percent of you are not. And it, there's a large majority, 28 of you, 28 percent are, are still thinking about it. So that's great. Hopefully, this webinar will help you make that decision today. So prescribed burning is an important land management tool throughout the southern forests, grasslands, and croplands. And in 2011, almost 6.5 million acres were burned by prescription for forestry purposes in the 13 southern states. Since those of you that are participating in this webinar are either forestry consultants or work with or interested in prescribed fire, I'm sure you're already aware of the multiple benefits that the use of prescribed fire achieves. However, just to reiterate, uh, some of the primary reasons to use prescribed fire as a land management tool include the items shown here. So fuel reduction, prescribed fire is definitely the most practical way to reduce dangerous accumulations. Without fuel reduction, fire hazard can be extremely high, especially in large contiguous stands. It can also be used for site preparation for seeding, planting, or natural regeneration. Insect and disease, uh, disease control, for example, controls brown spot needle blight and longleaf seedlings by burning off the infected needles. 
can improve wildlife habitat, for example, by opening up the ground level for travel and feeding and improving nutrient availability for plant growth and for forage, manage competing vegetation, and prescribed fire is by far the most economical way to do this w when possible. Chemical and mechanical treatments can be up to 10 to 20 times more expensive. For aesthetic enhancement, burning maintains open stands, produces changes in the vegetation, and increases the visibil visibility of flowering plants. And finally, biological community restoration and maintenance. Many plants actually have adaptations that favor a fire-dominated environment. So with these benefits, many landowners will actually pay a contractor to come burn their land. And as you'll hear from Don later, agencies such as the NRCS provide payments for certain prescribed burning activities. The need for more prescribed burning is not just a local issue here in North Carolina, but is a region-wide issue for the entire South. According to a survey of all state forestry agencies in the southeast, this is primarily due to lack of capacity, liability concerns, smoke management issues, and weather. Several organizations across the south are working together to collaborate and putting more fire on the ground. Right now, Longleaf Pine is the biggest regional effort to do this, even though we know more burning is needed in other ecosystems, too. This map that you see here is created by America's Longleaf Initiative, who set a goal to increase Longleaf from 3.4 million to 8 million acres by the year 2025. So I don't expect you to be able to read everything that's on this map, but if you can see each of the green circles, those depict significant geographic areas where there's already large tracts of existing Longleaf that could potentially be connected to over 100,000 acres of surrounding Longleaf habitat if it can be uh, restored back to Longleaf. As you can see, in North Carolina, there's three significant geographic areas in the North, Cal North Carolina Sand Hills, Blade and Lakes area, and Onslow Bight. And each of those have over 20,000 acres of existing longleaf. And since the longleaf is fire dependent, there need to be more prescribed, more prescribed burning in these areas for this to happen. Another organization that's decided to make prescribed fire priority is the Southeast Regional Partnership and Planning S Sustainability also known as SURPASS. The SURPASS prescribed fire work group is made up of many representatives from federal agencies, state agencies such as the North Carolina Forest Service and Southern Group of State Foresters, and nonprofit groups like the Longleaf Alliance. Representatives from each of these groups has joined the SURPASS prescribed fire work group because they understand the importance of prescribed fire and longleaf pine in their work. So for the 2013-14, some of their goals include to increase the number of trained, qualified, and experienced burners, minimize landowners' risk of liability associated with prescribed fire, and to minimize local smoke impacts on air quality. So here we come to another question for the audience. Um, if you could answer the, the poll, there's a button that says um, it looks like the little letter A in a square, and that's the button that you're going to want to scroll down. Um, right below where it lists the participants, there's a button there. And if you could answer yes or no, are you interested in conducting additional burns? Um, for those of you who answer yes, we're going to add a link into the chat box right now where you can sign up to be added as a burner on a contractor's list with the North Carolina Forest Service. And so we're going to enter that link into the chat box so you'll be able to go there. This is a new database that's not currently up and running yet, but it will add your name to this list if you're active. OK, and that will be for the local county or district areas where you work in. So we're going to go ahead and add that link. And it looks like just about everybody has responded now. For those of you who, OK, I see a lot of you are actually not forestry consultants as well. So that's good to know. Um, we're going to go ahead and publish the results now. So about 17% of you are interested in expanding your current client base. And we're going to go ahead and enter that link into the chat box now for you, too. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to Don Riley with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. OK, um, even though you can't 
respond to me. I'll go on and tell everyone good morning. I appreciate you being here. Um, uh, I was only given 10 to 15 minutes, and there's, uh, it would be naive of me to believe that we could cover everything uh, in that time frame. So uh, my goal for the next few minutes is to give you all a familiarity with uh, what NRCS um, does, who we are, uh, and what our goals and objectives are. Um, so for some of you, you may not be aware of who is NRCS. So just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, our agency was initially the Soil Conservation Service. It was founded in 1935. Um, and for those of us in North Carolina, we have bragging rights that the founder was a North Carolina native, uh, Mr. Hugh Hammond Bennett from Anson County. So a uh, feather in our cap, uh, and we can take credit for the start of this whole thing. Uh, but in 1994, you see there on the slide that um, the name changed to the Natural Resources Conservation Service just to reflect uh, more adequately what the agency had done, the, the expansive um, goals and objectives that we address. Um, you see there in the second bullet, uh, NRCS provides assistance to the local level through a cooperative relationship with landowners and partners. Uh, NRCS is a locally driven federal agency. Uh, it's something that makes us somewhat unique. Um, it gives the local folks uh, an opportunity to uh, provide input on what our goals and objectives and our priorities should be. Um, we take uh, pride in that we do have uh, a face to go along with our name uh, that represents every county. Uh, and then there in the bottom, we provide technical assistance to make science-based resource and land management decisions. Uh, so we have technical standards that are developed uh, through uh, disciplinary teams uh, that are the basis for all of the um, work that we accomplish on the ground. Our mission is to provide resources to farmers and landowners to aid them with the conservation of soil, water, energy, plant, and wildlife resources and improve air quality on privately owned lands. The key points there, you see there are privately owned lands. That's the focus of our agency. Um, is to work on the private lands within uh, our nation. Uh, that's our concentration, is to, to offer that assistance to those landowners who are needing um, both financial but primarily technical assistance. Um, and the next bullet there is, is a key point for those of you on this conference and what your potential uh, role or involvement could be is through voluntary enrollment in RCS works with landowners. Um, and that's a key point for us that everything that NRCS does is voluntary. Um, our involvement with the landowner is generally initiated by the landowner. Of course, we do outreach um, and we do um, public affairs and public relations work. But for the most part, it's the landowner seeking assistance, either through technical or financial assistance. And, and that's where we begin our work. So where should everything begin within RCS? Everything begins with a plan. Um, everything that we do uh, starts with that initial contact with the landowner and a site evaluation. Um, because we are a federal agency and a lot of times we will utilize public dollars to assist landowners, environmental compliance review is a part of uh, most of all of our actions. Um, typically our role is to develop alternatives uh, by which a landowner can uh, make decisions, which is that final point there, is that the landowner is the decision maker in our process. Of course, we, we offer those alternatives. We provide them uh, with information. We try to do our best to give them the most up-to-date um, research-backed documentation that we can. But ultimately, the landowner is that decision maker. You know, What is it that they're trying to achieve on their given piece of property, whether it's one acre or a thousand? Um, and we like to work with that landowner because then they can provide us the feedback that we need to then develop that plan accordingly. So keep in mind, that those of you uh, in your client base, that um, this is a, an area that NRCS and you all can work together to ultimately develop that plan that meets the objectives of the landowner. But today, specifically, uh, we're all here to talk about ways that we can be involved together, and one of those uh, obvious uh, 
elephants in the room is the financial assistance uh, component of what NRCS does. Um, just to kind of lay some groundwork, um, most of you all are familiar, uh, if you've watched the news at all, of the Farm Bill. Uh, the majority of everything I'm going to be talking about the next uh, few minutes is tied to the Farm Bill. That's where the, uh, the funding comes from that is uh, national or uh, federal dollars that are divvied out to the states in order to complete uh, ecological work. There are other uh, sources of revenue out there, other sources of funding, whether it be local or state, um, but specifically I'll be talking about the NRCS financial assistance programs. Um, a second um, disclaimer I will throw out there is that I will only be talking about those um, conservation programs. I will not be getting into the easement programs. We do have um, opportunities for landowners to enter into perpetual easements for conservation. I'm not going to go into those. We'll specifically be talking about those conservation programs. So what are some of the things that all of our programs have in common? The first is that funding is dependent upon ranking. So it's not a first come, first serve kind of situation. We have um, batching periods uh, where applications are collected. Um, each state has the ability to develop ranking criteria. And depending upon what that landowner's decisions are, what they're going to actually implement on the ground would be how that application would rank out. And then those would be compared amongst all the other applications within a particular funding pool. So ranking. Uh, the second is that participants must have an approved contract and are reimbursed for practices that are completed according, according to our specifications. So uh, this is not like a grant type of situation. There's, there's not money up front. Uh, there are some caveats there that I don't have time to go into now, but in your mind think that these are reimbursements. So after the work is completed, that's when the financial assistance comes in. And of course, those NRCS specifications. Everything that's done has to be implemented to, uh, according to an NRCS uh, standard and spec. Uh, reimbursement is based on a payment rate from a regionally developed payment schedule. Uh, this is something that's fairly new for our agency. And I'll just touch on this because I'm going to give a little bit of information later that's not going to be applicable to some of you. Um, the nation was divided into multiple uh, regions, and then our payment schedules were developed within that region. North Carolina happens to be in the region entitled the Appalachian region, which includes North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Um, we still consider ourselves a southeastern state, but for the regional payment scenarios, uh, we don't fall in with some of our neighbors to the south. Uh, so keep that in mind when I throw out some, some numbers for uh, cost share rates. Uh, I did put in there in red that it's, don't think of it as cost share. Think of it uh, as a reimbursement. Uh, Contracts are with individual landowners. Um, that is something that's unique to all the programs. Uh, NRCS will enter into an agreement with a landowner um, to implement work on their property. Uh, now, an entity may be eligible, uh, maybe not, but it's not necessarily an individual person, but an individual landowner. Uh, Second to the last bullet there, participants and land must meet eligibility requirements. Some of these can be complicated for those landowners who have never participated in our, in our programs before. So the key is to get those folks in the door soon in the process so we can help them through that process. Um, and then the last bullet, kind of going back to my previous slide, those contracts are meant to support the implementation of a conservation plan. So the plan first, the financial assistance comes later. So specifically, let's talk about a few of the programs that are out there and available. Uh, the first one is, in North Carolina anyway, uh, in a lot of ways, the flagship program. It's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Typically, um, it's the highest level funded program um, in our state anyway. Some of the other states may be different, but for our state, it's the highest funded program. Um, it does all of the types of work you can imagine out on the farm and private forest landscape, but specifically when it comes to prescribed burning, herbaceous, uh, in-stand and site prep burns are all eligible under EQIP. There are uh, payment schedules developed for each of those particular scenarios. Typically, the contracts run two to five years. EQIP does allow for up to a 10-year contract, but typically we 
we try to run shorter contracts because of the technical assistance dollars that are tied to those financial assistance dollars. So you think in your mind shorter duration contracts. Um, and then another important one, and again where we may have a uh, potential to to help each other out is that all applications with the prescribed fire must have an approved burn plan by a certified burner. Um, and that's an eligibility requirement uh, here in North Carolina. Again, for those of you that are in other states, this might not be something that's applicable to you. But for us here, uh, that's one of the things that we're requiring. And I'll, I'll describe more why at the very end of the presentation. And it has to do with workload. Um, but just know that that's something that you know, all of our folks that are applying for prescribed burning are going to need someone to assist them with the development of their burn plan. The next program is the Conservation Stewardship Program, it's, uh, CSP. And as you know, NRCS is uh, very fond of our acronyms. And I apologize for speaking in alphabet soup language. But CSP um, is kind of a rewards uh, those participants that are doing good things now. Um, Regular prescribed burning can factor into a base CSP stewardship payment. Uh, and the way CSP works is you know, individuals who are actively engaged in conservation can get a payment on their lands if they're willing to do additional um, enhancements. But prescribed burning is one of those things that could factor into how their uh, payment rate is developed. Um, Participants should answer CSP questions carefully because if they depend on a USDA program to get burns accomplished, um, that might cause them some issues. Um, and getting stewardship credit for a prescribed burn may make them ineligible for financial assistance under another program like EQIP. Um, and again, there at the bottom, at least one enhancement is required for them to be eligible. Basically, I bring CSP to you all because it's an opportunity for, for you when working with your clients to provide them with an opportunity to get uh, some potential call share assistance for work they've already accomplished and then, of course, work that they're willing to do in the future. Just another option for, for those individuals out there that are actively engaged in things like prescribed burning. The third program I want to mention to you is the Wildlife Habitat Incentives Program, uh, WIP for short. Um, honestly, this is going to be one that it would be extremely uh, important for those of you uh, to our south. Uh, but here in North Carolina, it's very limited. Um, WIP has taken somewhat of a change on the national level uh, and is more species focused. Um, and one particular species that uh, is focused for WIP uh, is the gopher tortoise. Well, as you know, the gopher tortoise and the longleaf pine uh, go hand in hand in a lot of ways. And we are not fortunate enough to have the species here in North Carolina. So. We unfortunately do not utilize WIP very often as of now. Uh, our habitat uh, requirements for the golden wing warbler, and it's just, which is a high elevation species in western North Carolina, uh, we do use burning, but the funding levels are somewhat limited. But I did want to mention WIP uh, to you all because it is another one of those options out there. It's available. Um, on most landscapes. Uh, it's a, a niche for those individuals who are very much interested in wildlife habitat enhancements. And for those of you, again, in the south uh, that have uh, more expansive opportunities uh, due to the species selection, this could be one that you all would be falling into uh, or your clients would be falling into and, and wanting to be interested in. CRP is the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, it's one of our older programs. It's been around a, a long while. Um, it's, a, it's unique in the fact that uh, NRCS and Farm Service Agency, which is our sister USDA um, branch, have joint ownership, for lack of better words, for this program. They are the lead. Uh, however, NRCS offers technical assistance, so the conservation planning, uh, development of specs, uh, development of uh, operation and maintenance, that would be NRCS's role. Payments, eligibility, those kind of things would be uh, the responsibility of Farm Service Agency. Uh, land must have a cropping history. This is specifically for 
uh, cropland uh, and pasture land. And so the cropping history is a requirement there. Uh, so existing forest land cutovers, things like that, would not be eligible. Um, Typically, they're 10 to 15 year contracts. And with CRP, there's the, the difference between some of the other programs is that they do have an, an annual soil rental rate payment. So there's also um, establishment payments uh, as well as uh, management uh, activity payments. But with, with CRP, there is a sole rental rate. So it's a, a 10 year agreement or 15 year agreement with an annual payment. Where prescribed fire comes into play with CRP is that it's utilized to meet some of the management requirements within the contract. Um, so it could be utilized on a number of, of the CRP practices. Um, some that would be uh, of interest to you all would be things like uh, continuous practice CP36, which is longleaf pine, and then general sign-up CP3, uh, which would be establishment of trees. Um, Site prep and in-stand burning are allowed under CRP. Uh, so when you're understanding how fire can play a role in CRP, know that it can be used uh, for both site prep as well as to, to manage those trees once established. But notice there in red at the bottom that uh, no other programs, at least federal programs like EQIP and WIP, can be used to, uh, to offer financial assistance for burning if CRP uh, happens to be um, on that particular piece of land. So we've moved out of the specific program uh, discussion. I wanted to, to just briefly mention a few things to you all, again, how you all in the private sector uh, could partner with us to, to grow burning within the state. And the first is through uh, the TSP program, which is the Technical Service Providers Program. Uh, I guess we'll call it a program. It's uh, more of an initiative. But uh, NRCS certifies TSPs uh, to complete technical planning for prescribed burning. In a nutshell, what the TSP program does is it allows private individuals to gain the ability to offer technical assistance just as if you are an NRCS employee. There's certain things involved as far as uh, getting yourself registered, but then what it would allow you to do, it would allow you to develop the plan, you to develop the specifications for your clients, and then NRCS would accept those plans and specifications. It would also allow you to do uh, certification of practice implementation so that all the work as far as that you're doing with your clients, you could provide that technical assistance just as if you were in RCS. And then NRCS's role would be administering the contract as far as actually making the payment, uh, handling the, the documentation. Um, where this um, specifically may become of interest to some of you is there, there is funding tied to the TSP program. Um, that funding is annually allocated, uh, so it's sometimes difficult to determine um, exactly how much each state will be receiving, but there is funding available uh, for that. The second thing I wanted to mention on this slide was something new for 2014. It's not a new idea, it's just new for prescribed burning, and that is conservation activity plans. Um, this is something that rolled out a few years back, um, and it's, it's expanded. It's grown into several areas, including energy uh, and now burning. And, and what the CAP is, the Conservation Activity Plan actually is, is it's a way for a landowner who needs a plan to come into NRCS, express that interest, and then for them to be able to work with an individual uh, like you all to develop a plan. That plan has a set payment rate and that, uh, that landowner would be paid and then our hope would that eventually they would pay you for your services. Um, it does not bind them to implement the plan, but it does give them something to work with so that they could then come in and be uh, able to apply for uh, financial assistance for those uh, actions within the plan. I mention this as new with asterisks simply because I'm not 100% sure of how this is all going to come out uh, this FY for 2014. There is a potential um, that some things will change, uh, but I did want to bring it to your attention as something you know to kind of keep your eyes peeled for, to kind of see if this is something you might be interested in. And then the last thing I want to mention on this side, if any of you are at all interested 
and becoming certified as a TSP, the simplest thing to do is go to one of your uh, search engines and just type in TechReg, as you see right there on the bottom right, T-E-C-H-R-E-G. It'll pop up. There's all kinds of information there for you. Uh, you can go in there, look, see if it's something you might be interested in. If you are, you can contact uh, someone within RCS, within the state office, whatever state you're in, and find additional information. So to kind of wrap up, uh, just wanted to throw out there just kind of the state of the union for NRCS. You know, where do we stand specifically when it comes to um, financial assistance specifically for prescribed burning? Uh, the first I'll mention is financial assistance levels as far as the amount of funding we received, at least in North Carolina, for longleaf pine and forestry have increased. Um, and increased substantially over the last uh, five years or so. For instance, uh, some numbers that I just briefly picked up to give you an idea, from 2010 to 2012, just that few year period there, $1.7 million was allocated to prescribed burning and fire breaks, just those two practices within those years, and that is just under equip and whip. Um, that's a pretty substantial amount of money uh, for our state, and I'm not sure how this compares to other states throughout the nation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of that burning was done in 2010 and 12. It means that money was allocated to contracts for burning or, or fire breaks within that time window. Um, I do not have 13 numbers yet because we have not yet completed um, our allocations, but just keep that in mind that there's, there's a lot of financial assistance out there available, and there's a lot of interest. Um, but the third, the third bullet is one uh, that concerns a lot of us and, and really is my reason for being here today to talk with you all, is that pres prescribed burning has the highest rate of modifications compared to all other practices offered in our state. So out of all the financial assistance programs we have and all of the activities that we offer cost share assistance, prescribed burning tends to have the highest rate of modifications. Now, you all are telling me that that makes sense because burning uh, can be difficult to implement. Well, that's true. Uh, it, it can be. The weather and, and many other parameters tie into that. But another reason for that is just the simple uh, lack of um, available individuals who can help get the work done for our private landowners. Um, so we definitely want to continue to grow the program, but we need your help. Um, we're quickly reaching capacity. Um, maybe we've passed capacity, but we still have an enormous interest. I mean, in 2013, we'll have substantial volumes of money tied up into prescribed burning and fire breaks again. So the landowners are wanting it. Uh, it's getting the work done is, is where we are. But a couple of cautionary uh, points I wanted to point out in, in our State of the Union is, is be aware. Uh, when you have clients with a contract, help keep them on schedule. You know, a lot of times we'll have landowners who will sign up for uh, cost share assistance, they'll get a contract, and then it uh, goes on the dashboard of the pickup truck and um, beca becomes uh, second priority, and we understand that. Um, but uh, you all, if you're involved with clients who have contracts, um, help keep them on, on schedule. Help us help them keep them on schedule. And of course, the last is uh, obviously communication. Uh, Ultimately, that individual with the contract has the responsibility to complete the work. Uh, however, we as the agency have an obligation to make sure that we help keep them informed. And if you all are going to be assisting with them, we'll hope that you'll help take on some of that responsibility again of, of staying on schedule. And again, there are some rules and regulations that are in place that hinder our ability to communicate outside of with that individual we have a contract with. But you know, there are ways that we can work with you all. We want to be able to do that. So uh, open communication um, can definitely be a factor that will help us get some of this burning completed. Um, and I know that there will probably be questions that we're going to take in at the end. And I do apologize for the, the very quick uh, run through of where NRCS plays a role. Um, but I'll be happy to, to talk with any of you. Uh, you can easily find me. I think some uh, contact information may be provided at the end. Um, but that's kind of the rundown of NRCS involvement with prescribed burning in North Carolina. And I'm going to turn it back over at this time.
Thank you, John. So now that we've heard from the NRCS, we're interested in getting your feedback. And we have another question for the audience. Uh, I know some of you last time were answering in your chat box, so just make sure to use the drop down menu to answer the question. But what is the least amount of money that you would need to make in order to consider expanding your prescribed burning services? So when you answer this question, think about it either being for one individual tract or possibly multiple properties in a bundled area where you'd bring in a crew for a period of time, for example, five different 10 acre properties all in the same county. And if you're not interested or um, if you're not a forestry consultant, please answer E for this question. So we're going to go ahead and uh, publish the results here in a second. And if you're not interested, in the chat box, you can tell us why if you'd like to. We're going to go ahead and publish these results. Okay, so this is actually not going to be an applicable question for a lot of you at this point. So hopefully now, if you don't already burn, we've interested in possibly adding prescribed burning as an additional service to your clients, and you're interested in learning more. Well, what are the next steps? So if you're already burning, you know that it takes education, training, and experience. And you heard Don mention the term certified prescribed burner. So what is a certified burner? Each state has different requirements on what this entails, but in North Carolina, this is a five-step process, which I'll go into more detail in the next few slides. But first, uh, we'd like to know whether you're currently a certified burner, no matter, no matter what state you're listening in from today. So you can either answer A, yes, or B, no, if you're already a certified burner. And I'll give you just a second here. We're going to go ahead and publish these results. And it looks like, that's great, about 37% of you are already burning. In North Carolina, there's several steps that you have to go through in order to become a certified burner. I do want to mention that these requirements vary from state to state, so if you'd like to become a certified burner in another state, you'll have to check with them uh, with your state forestry agency to follow up for that particular state. Uh, if you are already certified in another state, but you're also interested in becoming certified in North Carolina, the North Carolina Forest Service has accepted other state certifications in the past. However, at a minimum, you would have to attend the sections on smoke and the North Carolina Prescribed Burn Act during the training course before they would issue you a North Carolina burner number. So in North Carolina, the first step to becoming certified would be to attend the prescribed burner course and pass the test at the end of the course with at least a 70% or better. So the next course is actually coming up soon here on October 15th and 16th. The course is usually offered annually. It's usually in the fall. It's a two-day course held at the Montgomery Community College in Troy. It's $25 a person, and you can register on the North Carolina Forest Service website, which I have shown here. These are just some of the topics that are, would be covered in the course. In the classroom portion, you'll learn about the state laws on prescribed fire, discuss the smoke management guidelines, and learn about fire weather behavior techniques. And in the field portion, you'll have the chance to learn how to write a burn prescription. Right now, the course is usually only offered in Troy. However, an additional location could be added if there is enough interest. So my question to you all now is, where would be the most convenient area to receive training? If you're already certified, what about maybe if they offered a refresher course or some other sort of training? So would it be in the western, central, or eastern part of the state? So it looks like we have a few answers coming in. I'm guessing for those of you not in North Carolina, um, you probably don't need to answer this question. So we're going to go ahead and publish these results. And it looks pretty even here throughout the state. If you are already certified and 
maybe you just need a refresher, or if you'd like to learn more about prescribed burning before you decide to become certified, there's actually an online basic prescribed fire training course now available through eExtension. I put their website at the top here. It's just campus.extension.org. And then to get to the prescribed fire training, you would click on energy and environment, and then go down to rangelands, and then pres basic prescribed fire training. And although this won't allow you to become a certified burner, you can still learn about the basics of prescribed fire and get a certificate of achievement if you complete the entire course. And I'll actually be adding more information from the southeast to this uh, training course over the next few months, including laws for each state. So keep your eyes open for that as well. Next step in becoming a certified burner is to prepare a burn plan with the necessary information. And here, uh, this is a template burn from the North Carolina Forest Service. I know you probably can't read everything that's included here, but as you can see, it's very detailed. The certification class provides more information on completing the burn plan and how to write this out. So some of the things listed here are general information. Uh, you also need to include your burn objectives, the fuel type, basal area, distance to the nearest smoke sensitive areas, acceptable weather conditions, available resources, things of that nature. And there's also spaces to include information during the burn, um, during mop-up, and during a post-burn evaluation. You have the option to use either this template from the Forest Service, or you can use your own burn plan as long as it has all of the required information from the North Carolina Prescribed Burning Act included. So you can write a burn plan. Under North Carolina law, only certified prescribed burners can write a burn plan. Uh, this in could include landowners, consultants, as Don mentioned, technical service providers, agency staff, or anyone who's certified. At a minimum, the following, uh, the information on the burn plan must contain all of the information required by the Burning Act. And these are just some resources that could help you to write your burn plan. The North Carolina Forest Service website, there's also a prescribed fire smoke management pocket guide that provides a checklist of items related to air quality and smoke management. Um, this will also actually be made into a mobile app, hopefully by the end of the year, so you can keep an eye out for that. The Southern Fire Exchange provides numerous fire-related resources for the Southeast, including a section called Planning Your Burn. Also, the U.S. Forest Service recently updated the Introduction to Prescribed Fire and Southern Ecosystems Manual. You can find this online, or if you're like me and prefer a hard copy, you can actually go to the Forest Service website and request a free copy copy be sent to you in the mail. And starting on page 55 is an entire section on planning your burn. The next step is to obtain all of the necessary burn permits and authorizations and notify nearby residents and emergency response agencies about the coming burn. So you want to give your neighbors plenty of advance notice a few weeks before you burn, as well as the day of the burn, and then once you've completed the burn. And to apply for a burn permit, you just go to the, the website that I have posted here. You can also find this website by just Googling uh, North Carolina burn permits and it takes you to the online burn system. The fourth step is to conduct the burn under North Carolina smoke management guidelines following the burn plan while observed by a certified burner on site. So notice that you must have another burner who's already certified be with you when you conduct the burn. And uh, the link that I've posted here is for the North Carolina smoke management guidelines. This is also posted on the North Carolina Forest website and explains what type of burning is allowed in each type of category day one through five. And these guidelines are covered in detail during the certification course. The fifth and final step to becoming a certified burner is to have the certified burner observe the burn, submit a recommendation of certification burn plan, and a map of the burn. If the certified burner doesn't think you're necessarily ready to be certified, they may ask you to do another burn or as many as it takes until they think you're ready to become certified and put their name on that recommendation form. So just be aware of that. Now we have another question for the audience to find out the level of experience in the group. And we'd like to ask you, how many acres do you currently burn on average each year? If you don't burn at all yet, uh, please choose A, not applicable. If you do burn, though, please choose B, 1 through 50, C, 50 through 100, D, 100 through 500, or E, greater than 500. I see lots of responses coming here. It looks like we have a lot of experienced burners on our hands. I'm going to go ahead and publish these results. 
Wow, and 41% of you are actually already burning over 500 acres on average per year. That's great. Oh, I'm sorry, 10, that was 10 percent. So for those of you who are burning, you, you may or may not know that there's actually insurance options available from several companies to cover prescribed burning. I conducted a survey and found that these seven companies all provide insurance coverage for burning, either under the extended forester's policy or as a separate standalone insurance uh, just for prescribed fire. If you'd like this list, I'm going to provide my email address on the last slide so you can send me an email copy asking for it. As for the cost of the policies, prices vary widely between companies. It's best to call around and do your homework, just like you would for your car or house insurance, to find out which policy might work best for you. If you're a member of the Association of Consulting Foresters, there's discounted rates through Outdoor Insurance Group. Uh, the Society of American Foresters has a partnership with the Davis Garvin Insurance Agency who offers burning liability coverage for the property being burned and smoke liability provided at the limit you select up to $1 million. Insurance companies provide different discounts to members of various organizations. So if you're a member of an organization where burning is, burning is encouraged, you may want to check with them to see if there's any insurance options available for members, and if so, uh, which company. For example, the National Wild Turkey Federation and soon to be also the Longleaf Alliance offer prescribed fire insurance to their members through outdoor underwriters at around $300 for a burn less than 200 acres. So this type of burn, per burn policy might be useful for landowners or consultants who burn small tracts or only who burn once or twice a year. Most all of the insurance policies only provide coverage if you're a certified burner, so stick with your burn plan and um, if, if you follow all of the state laws in regards to burning. In North Carolina, we have what's called the North Carolina Prescribed Burning Act, and you can find the full act online, uh, which I included the link at the bottom of this page, but I just wanted to highlight a few of the main parts of it here. I won't go through the entire thing, but I did want to note that all of them do say that it must be prepared, prepared by a certified burner. Um, on part B, I did want to mention that uh, some people may not be aware of this, but a landowner can actually conduct their own burning without being certified if the landowner is burning a track less than 50 acres and is following all of the conditions established by a prescription by a certified burner. So even though the landowner can still legally burn their own property if it's less than 50 acres, the burn still needs to be prepared by a certified burner. The next part of the act discusses liability. If you look at part B, it says that the landowner or the landowner's agent who conducts a prescribed burning in compliance, um, which well, that was the last slide we just saw, shall not be liable in any civil action for damage or injury calls from smoke. Notice that this doesn't say anything about fire at this point. And then part C goes on to say that it does not apply um, from a negligently or improperly conducted burning. Basically what that last slide was saying is that the Burn Act provides civil liberty protection for smoke as long as you're not negligent and you comply with the Burn Act. There's no law that provides civil or criminal liability protection for escaped fires in North Carolina at this time. Other states um, do provide this protection for fire too, so if you're listening in from another state, you'll want to check with your own state to see what the laws are there. So here are some things you might want to avoid. Uh, you can be found guilty of misdemeanor and possibly assessed a fine if no notice is provided to adjacent landowners, if a watchman doesn't guard the fire, or if the fire is not fully extinguished. You can be liable for any off-site fire damage if you're negligent in conducting the burn. And according to law enforcement, most of the tickets given are actually for allowing the fire to escape either from insufficient burn resources to not enough people or equipment on site or from insufficient monitoring of the site. Just as a reminder, um, we do have a law enforcement staff on hand at the end to answer any questions if, if anyone has any about this information, but uh, here's some information about getting tickets. Usually a warning is given if it's a first time offense and tickets are only issued if it's a repeated occurrence. You could get a waiver if you adhere to the burn plan written by a certified burner and if sufficient attention was given prior, during, and after the burn, but every case is different, so all cases are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. 
in, in North Carolina, there are actually very few civil cases resulting from escape fire. Having a bit of it, okay. Um, so as you can see, there's many groups that provide prescribed fire resources. These are just a few. Uh, the link at the bottom is for the Southern Fire Exchange, where there's a table of, that provides the websites and more information for all of these resources. But I just wanted to show here that there are multiple agencies out there that provide resources on prescribed fire throughout the Southeast. From their website, um, the, the North Carolina Fire Council says that they foster cooperation among all parties in North Carolina with an interest or stake in prescribed fire. And uh, these are just many of the, some, a few of many of the benefits that membership provides. And um, one of those is reduced registration fees for meetings. And there's actually an upcoming meeting which I wanted to mention. It's a joint meeting with the Longleaf Coalition. It's in Wilmington on August 27th and 28th. It's not too late to join. So you can find more details about the meeting and how to register on their website. And if you're not in North Carolina, most all states in the southeast actually have fire councils that you could join in your state. So in conclusion, uh, I just wanted to say that prescribed burning is becoming more increasingly utilized, but more is definitely necessary. As we discussed, there's multiple benefits of prescribed fire. Funding is available, and finally, more technical service providers, forestry consultants, and certified burners are, are still needed. And at, from here, we'll have uh, NRCS and North Carolina Forest Service staff on hand to answer any questions. So if you do have any, please go ahead and, and type them in the chat box if you haven't already done so. OK. Great. So um, just to remind you, Just to remind you that um, we do have four service staff. We have Robert Smith with law enforcement, and we also have Phil Wallace, who's a Longleaf conservation specialist. And then we have two NRCS staff. We have Robert Horton, and then, of course, we have Don, and we have Jen Evans here, too. I've seen a few questions that you have typed, um, and they are NRCS questions. So I'm going to hand the, the microphone over to, to Don, OK? Okay, so the question is this uh, cap or the conservation activity plan, is it available in other states? Um, it could be available in all states. It will be dependent upon, uh, first and foremost, what is finalized at the national level as far as uh, what uh, leadership uh, will provide to the states. And then at that point, the states will have the opportunity to offer uh, those CAP plans as a cost shareable or a, or a financial assistance available uh, activity within their state. So I guess the roundabout answer would be yes, uh, provided that everything comes through for FY14, that all 50 states uh, and the territories would have the opportunity to take advantage of conservation activity plans. OK, the next question is somewhat lengthy. It says, oh. Okay, the question is, what happens if a burn cannot be conducted? Um, and I actually saw an earlier question about uh, what happens if a CAP plan is written and it can't be implemented. So I'll answer both of those questions uh, at one time. In the situation of a CAP, a conservation activity plan, uh, remember what I had said, that there is no requirement that the plan be implemented. Uh, the requirement is that the plan be developed to NRCS specifications. So if an individual were to get funding for a conserva conservation activity plan, they were to write the plan, that's it for that contract. So if the burn is not implemented, then there is no uh, issue there. Second part of that question is what happens if a burn does not get implemented? I'm going to assume that would be a cost shared 
item under, say, equip or maybe CRP. In that case, what would happen is uh, that individual would be working with their local NRCS representative. If there's sufficient reason as to why the burn could not be implemented, then we do have the opportunity to uh, to modify the contract and move the funding forward. Uh, I will say though that has become the issue, uh, and typically we try not to modify contracts more than once, maybe twice, uh, because what happens is that that work begins to move out further in time. Um, it becomes harder and harder to do quality assistance on. So. I don't want to give the impression that you know the hammer is going to drop if you don't get it in that first uh, opportunity to burn. There is opportunity to do modifications, um, but know that that is the objective. That is the goal is to try to get these things put in timely. Um, not sure if that fully answers the question, but that that's where that is. And I think there's a question now for the North Carolina Forest Service. Okay, uh, we had a question come up. Uh, does the North Carolina Forest Service share opportunities with consultants? And I uh, asked to clarify that question a little bit, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and attempt to answer that. Um, when uh, requests come in, those are these come in from the local counties, and the counties are aware of those requests. So the, I guess the answer in short would be contact your local county rangers and uh, they will let you know what landowners out there are looking for, for burning services, but that is maintained at the county level. Uh, I hope that answers the uh, question there. Okay, excellent. So we still have time for another question or two. If anyone else has a question, please feel free to type it in the chat room. I also want to let those of you who are, know who are not from North Carolina, um, but, or if you have further questions later on, just feel free to contact Jennifer Evans because she does have information for other states and she could point you to the right resources or if you have a question for uh, North Carolina later on, feel free to still contact Jennifer Evans and she can help you with finding the right resources. So let's see, we have one more question. Nope. Oh, he's just clarifying. So that, okay, says that works. So I think that's about all of the time today. So, oh, we have one last question. Oh, okay. So, what is the best way to get in contact with landowners who need burning services? I think that might be a field question. Okay. Again, I think this question uh, somebody asked. Uh, Jason asked. Uh, it was mentioned several times during the presentation. Forestry consultants are needed to help uh, implement prescribed burns. What is the best way to contact landowners who need burning services? And again, uh, requesting that information from your local county ranger, they should be uh, maintaining a, a list of landowners who are in need of those services uh, and, and putting you in, and putting you as uh, contractors in touch with those landowners. Okay, great. So. Um, just again, if you have any other questions, feel free to email Jen Evans. She has her email on this, this page right here. I also want to just thank our speakers today. It was great to have both NRCS and Forest Service with us.